Uh, I shared this on a post recently, but the Lord just won't let me get away from this revelation. He just keeps speaking to me about it. And uh, I've had two or three confirmations in the service today that this is right. It's what he wants me to, to mention. So, um, and even Terry, when he read the, uh, the tribute to these guys, quoted from, read from Exodus 14, and that's where I'm going. So, I tell you, the Lord's about to, he's about to do some stuff. <laughs> he's doing stuff, but he's going to do some more stuff. So, I'm going to read a good bit of this chapter. Maybe the whole thing. For those of you that have your Bibles, open them. If you have your phone, turn it. Uh, I don't think that's a very spiritual approach to just bring your phone, your Bible on your phone. But if that's it's as high as you've risen in your walk that you just <laughs> then turn in your phone. You got your Bible today, Greg, or you just say... Just your phone. <clears throat> this makes me want to weep. So, Exodus 14, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back. He's throwing a curve to them. See, I want you to backtrack. And camp before Pahairoth, something like that, and Migdal, between Migdal and the sea. You'll camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it by the sea. He told him specifically, this is where I want you to go. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they're wandering aimlessly in the land because when he did this, when the Lord did this, it just looked like these guys are wandering around aimlessly, lost. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. So Pharaoh, he said, is going to see this and say they're wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in because this location that God told them to go to, naturally speaking, trapped them. There's a mountain behind them. There's a sea in front of them. There's no place to go. The only way out was filled with the army of Egypt, Pharaoh and his soldiers. So God led them into a trap. Sometimes when it looks like you're being trapped, He's really trapping the enemy. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and his army and the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. And they did so. They went back to this place. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people and said, what, what is this we've done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and they overtook them. They caught up with Israel by the sea beside Paharoth in front of Baal Zephon. And as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
Why have you dealt with us this way? Bringing us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Uh, can, can you believe this? Sound like half the church today, you know. Just put up with all the stuff, you know. So, yeah, just. <laughs> it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in this wilderness. Moses said to the people, don't fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you will never see him again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Now, it seems like probably Moses said this to the people and then sort of snuck off by himself and said, help Because the next verse, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. That's a good word, isn't it? Go forward. If, you don't, if you're a leader and you don't know what to tell the church right now, I can tell you what to tell the church. Go forward. And it's for you, Moses, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel go through, in the, through the midst of the sea on dry land. And as for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. I'll be honored through Pharaoh and his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. <clears throat> so it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness. Yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, horsemen went in after them into the midst of the sea and it came about at the morning watch that the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. <clears throat> and he caused their chariot wheels to swerve and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let's get out of here. For the Lord is fighting for them. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak. While the Egyptians were fleeing right into it, then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What a good story. The, most of you, I'm sure, know that the exodus, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, 
the fulfilling of the promise to Abraham that when the time is right and the iniquity, the cup of iniquity of the Amorites has been complete, I'm going to give you the, this land. Let me just back up and make sure you understand that. When God promised this land to Abraham, in his justice, he would not give it yet. He said to Abraham, I'm going to do this, but the cup of iniquity is not yet full among the Amorites. So I'm going to wait until it is, and then give it to you. Now that was 400 years later. So even though God knew they would come to a state of such evil and wickedness that he could justly take it from them and give it to Abraham, he still wouldn't do it until it really happened in his justice. But now that has taken place and he can fulfill the promise and so when he's doing this to deliver them from Egypt all of these ten plagues that he brings represent one of the gods of Egypt so in his uh, you know dealing with the water and it becomes blood and the cattle and the flies all these things pictured or represented one of the gods of Egypt. So God is not only delivering Israel, he's judging the idols, the idolatry. He's demonstrating to these people, <clears throat> both Israel as well as Egypt, he's demonstrating to them that these idols are not really God, I am. So he's making a statement. He's not just making a statement because he wants to show off. This is not God just saying, I'll show them who's God. It's, he, he makes one statement here, and I'm going to get to this again in a minute, but he says that the, not just that Israel, what I'm about to do, and it's not just so that Israel will know I'm God and that I'll be honored, but Egypt. He wants, once, he, <clears throat> once we, he deals with the, with the wicked leadership, he wants the people of Egypt to know these gods of Baal can't help you. I'm God. When you study this passage, the theologians and the writers and, and Hebrew scholars say this, this was an act of grace. This judging of these gods was an act of grace toward Egypt and showed God's heart that while he was judging this wicked, this wicked ruler and this army, he wanted to reveal who he was to the people of Egypt. I was never taught that in Sunday school. I just thought he hated the Egyptians. Everything God does, even when he's judging, he, you, you never... He never abandons his redemptive heart. I mean, when he's days away from destroying Nineveh, wicked, wicked, wicked city. When repentance comes, well, of course, I'd much rather give you revival than judgment. It's the heart of God. So he's, he's judging these and, and revealing to, to Israel and to Egypt that these gods are not gods. And of course, they leave Egypt, they take the spoils, but God's not finished. And he takes them on a certain route. And Pharaoh evidently has scouts or some, some, some way of knowing what they're doing. And he, he says, turn around, go back to here. And he takes them to a place where, as I said earlier, they're trapped. They set up camp there. 
when the armies of Egypt came this way, there's no way out now. It's over. It's humanly impossible now. If something in the way of a tremendous miracle doesn't take place, it's over. And they knew it. The place he took them was facing a hill with a monument there. And this place was called Baal Zephon, the Lord of the North. Baal had several different descriptive names. He called him, you know, and so uh, some of the names referred to fertility. So Baal's, they worship, we worship this, this, this part of God. It's like we call him our, our God, the provider, our savior, our redeemer, our banner, our victory. Well, they, had, they did this for Baal. See, the devil's always, you know, he wants, he, he wants what belongs to God. So Baal means Lord or master. So he, he through these people, these regions, gave himself all these names. He's the, he's the God of fertility. He's the one that helps us reproduce. He's the God of the harvest, Lord, Baal. He's the Lord of the harvest. Not him, but Baal. And so all of these terms, he's the Lord, our provider. One of the terms was money. He's the Lord of our money. And this, this one was, he's the Lord of, you could translate it winter or north. It's a Hebrew term. And because of the location far to the north, the Hebrew being a picture language, it became a term associated with winter, wind, cold winds the sea. So this was, this was a very, to the Egyptians, a very powerful God, Baal Zephon, the Lord of the, of the seas and the north wind and the, this strong, mighty God, this Baal. And, and Hebrew scholars, writers, in their writings, they actually, they actually quote what they believe that's been passed down to them that Pharaoh actually said. That he actually said, and they put it in quotes, God has, our God has trapped them. And their God could deal with all these other gods of Egypt. But he, he, can't, he can't deal with Baal Zephon. Baal Zephon has trapped him and his people. Because this God that we have is stronger than theirs. Finally, one of our gods is stronger. And the Lord brought him back there. Because no one knew it but him. And what he was saying was, I've left one so I can finish the job. And when I judge that one, I want it to be right in front of the monument they built to him. And the one they call the Lord of the Sea, I'm going to kill their army through the sea. I'm going to make their God bow down before me. I don't have to lead them where I want them to go by rolling back the water or using the wind. But I'm going to use the wind and the water because I'm going to judge Baal. about 14, 15 years ago. I went 
into a season where the spiritual warfare against me was very intense, more so than I had ever experienced. When you do what we do, you experience that. You, you just, you just, you just, live, you just learn to just push through the stuff. Wear your armor and use your weapons and do what you need to do. But this was different. And there was, a, it was, it was, it was almost like I stepped into a cocoon of, of evil. And it was like, sometimes I described it like, like I was in a, a, a swarm of bees but it just felt like demons flying around. It was just, you resist them and you get a little relief and here they come again. And, and the, the barrage of words, comments, statements, thoughts that you know, I, I, I should be able to stop this. What is it? Sometimes I would go to my basement. We were in Colorado at the time and I'd go to the downstairs family room two, three in the morning, just build a fire and sit there and put worship on and just pray in tongues. And finally I said, I called Chuck, Pier I called Dutch Pierce or Chuck, whatever his name is. <laughs> Chuck Sheets, I called Ch Chuck Sheets. <laughs> those of you that weren't here Friday night, then that won't mean anything to you. I said, man, I to tell him what I was going through. And I said, I don't understand what's happening. Do you have any insight for me? Are you picking up anything? He says, yeah, Chuck's a prophet. I said, do, do you, what is this? He said, it's Baal. I said, Baal? And Baal was way back then. <laughs> Think about, you know, obviously demons don't then die. Yeah, he said it's the spirit of Baal. It's the ruling spirit over America. And in your role in this nation, God is allowing this confrontation because he wants you to study and learn about this so you can teach the rest of us about it. <laughs> I'm thinking, thanks a lot. <laughs> this is your word to me? <laughs> he said, talk to you later. Hangs up the phone. I'm thinking, <laughs> so I, I, I did just that. I studied this, studied Baal, taught on it. This, is, this became the message of the call on 777 in Nashville, July 7th, 07, was we are divorcing Baal. Because anytime you, a lot of times when God was dealing with Baal or with Israel who had turned to Baal worship, when he was breaking that off of them, you would find uh, the number seven repeated in many different ways because seven was a number of covenant and marriage. And so Baal was considered the God they were married to and in covenant with. And so God would do symbolic things to show you are breaking, I wanna break your marriage and your covenant with Baal and move you back into covenant with me. And so that became, when Lou Engel was told to do the call on 777, he said, I don't know why, but I know we're supposed to do it on 777. Then this message came and this teaching about Baal, and he understood then that's what this is all about. We're going to repent for our idolatry and the, for allowing Baal, the human sacrifices, all that stuff, the abortion, that's all caused by the spirit of Baal. Even Jezebel is a spirit that operates under Baal. So he said, we're gonna, that's what this is all about. 
So then assignments begin to come to the body of Christ. And entire prayer movements for months knew that they were, they were to do prayer journeys, go to places, repent on behalf of the nation for the things we had done to, to come into alignment with this spirit. And, and then do prophetic acts and prayers to, to decree that America is moving back into covenant or sevening herself back to the Lord. And that's been going on now, off and on since then. I find it interesting that when I was back in Nashville at Kent Christmas's gathering on July 4th, in my hotel room saying, Lord, I wasn't even on the schedule. We just decided the last minute, we just want to go and support what they're doing there and and hear what some of the prophets are saying. And, and when he found out that I was going to be there, he asked me to be on one of the panels and do, if you saw it, what I did. But I said, Lord, you know, when I'm on that panel, is there anything you want to say or you want me to talk about that you want to tell me now, the, the evening before? And he led me to this passage. And I found myself thinking, it's like full circle. I'm back in Nashville, and you, when I ask you what you want to talk about, and you bring me back to this Baal thing. So what's that all about? And I'll tell you what it's all about. God fixing to finish the job. <clears throat> Just like he did with Egypt. Just like he did with these Baals back then and the gods he had already judged. He said, I saved one because I, I need to make a statement. I need to let everybody know that I'm the Lord. Baal means Lord. That I'm the Lord of everything. And that's why you got stuck on that phrase today. <clears throat> he says that... You, I've already demonstrated my power over him here, but now I'm going to finish it. And right in front, right in front of his idol, right in front of that hill, you camp right there because that's where I'm going to stretch out my rod of authority and show the whole nation and the nations that there is not one aspect of Baal that is really, that is really true. He's not the master of anything. I am. And I tell you what the Lord's saying to us right now. Do not think that the God who started this process of turning this nation back to him, of bringing this great outpouring, which is going to deliver a nation, bring revival and help us restore and reform and finish the destiny that he's given this land to be his trumpet of the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Do not think that the God who started this cannot finish it. Do not think that just because it looks like the enemy won. And that we're backed up against the sea with no way out now. Do not think that God was in any way confused, overruled, overtaken by this foul spirit of Baal. Do not think he's ever been outsmarted, outmaneuvered, or outfought. And I'll say this to you right now. In this nation, he has the devil where he wants him. Front and center. And he is going to expose the evil doers. He is going to bring 
the revival that he has promised. And it's going to change not just hearts, souls, for eternity's sake. It's going to change the mentality of a nation. Twice in this chapter, he says, I'm going to be honored through this. Not just by Israel. He said, I'm going to be honored by Egypt. What would you, would you, would you, what would you think? Would you believe me if I told you that the word honor there is the word glory? Kabod. I'm not only going to be glorified by my people. I'm going to be glorified by my enemy. I'm going to make them give me glory. And if you don't think that the whole, that entire part of the world understood this war of the gods this is this is the very reason that you see phrases in the old testament like the god of israel because all these other gods existed and it was this whose god is the strongest whole region heard the story their God his name's Yahweh he's the baddest of all the gods <laughs> what did Rahab say 45 years later when the spies went in to check out the land, and she remember, and she hid the spies, and said, and they said, because you've, you're doing this, you won't be destroyed with the rest of this city. Tie the scarlet cord in your window so we know where your place is, and make sure all your relatives get in here, because everybody else is going to die. And what did she say when they came? We've heard the story of how your God dried up the Red Sea. Let me paraphrase that. We heard the story about how your God, Yahweh, kicked our God, Baal Zephon's butt. I cleaned that up for, most, for some of you out there. Some of you probably wouldn't have cared, but I cleaned it up. This was big news. God was not just delivering Israel. He was making a statement to those nations, trying to reveal himself to them, to break the stronghold of Baal off of them. And I tell you, when God brings his full deliverance and turn to this, to this nation and this revival comes, it's not just for you and I, it's not for the church. He's gonna show himself to those that don't know him. He's going to do things in a way that when the breakthroughs start happening and the signs and wonders and the revival and the turning of education and all these things, people are going to say, this is God. I, this is God. I guess, you know, the, one of the things I really want you to know is that I feel like we, 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 we must consciously think about the fact that the timing of this, that what, what's being said now by the prophetic voices, the intercessors, the apostolic leaders about this revival, this breakthrough that's coming, 
you know, for God to take, take me, for me to decide with my schedule three days ahead of time, I'm going to a conference somewhere when I'm not a speaker. I mean, it's a break for me. To sit at home, especially on a holiday. And Cece feels the same way. I mean, for her to say, hey, maybe we're supposed to go to that meeting in Nashville. I mean, I was thinking the same thing, but I wasn't going to say it. I thought she'd afraid she'd throw something to me, at me. <laughs> what do you mean we're supposed to go? I mean, we get some days off. She says, I saw this ad again, this, uh, the, the announcement again. I thought, maybe we're supposed to go to that. Then I talked to to, to Kent, we were thinking about coming. You can get us a couple of seats. And, oh, are you kidding? Yeah, I get you some. I'm telling you why the Lord did this. He's going to take me back to Nashville. Seven, seven, seven. And talk to me about Baal again. He's about to deal another blow to that spirit over this nation yeah. so I'm going to pray into this I want to know first just say either one of you want to add anything or jump in or prophesy or whatever before I pray okay you want, maybe you want to come up here in case you want to jump in and pray and let me, let, me, let me give you permission to do whatever you want to do something here today, if you would. <laughs> Rachel, maybe, maybe you could come up and I just, I just feel like the Lord's, he just, he wants us to know I'm going to glorify myself. I'm going to, I will be honored in this land again. I'm going to bring glory to my name and I am going to bring deliverance, but I'm going to bring judgment too. I'm going to judge my enemies. He's going to love all the people he can love and take care of them. But, he, but those that stand in his way, he's going, to have to, he's going to have to deal harshly with some of them. And you just got to let him do what he needs to do. I mean, he's going to. Won't you stand up and let's pray into this for a minute. Lord, you are you even, you even once called yourself, used the name Baal to reference yourself because it means Lord and Master. And you said, I'm Baal Perizim. I'm the Lord God of breakthrough, not this piece of wood or rock over here. It's me, and I'm the God of the wind, and I'm the God of winter, summer, spring, and fall. And I'm the God of the seas and the oceans. I'm the master and Lord of everything. And Lord, you're the, you're the master and Lord of America. Yes. And we sang it earlier. You're Lord of everything and we have no king but Jesus. We will serve no other gods. And that the, the, the land that we have given away you are helping us reclaim for you that we can become the light you need this nation to be in this hour. And we're going to see that happen, Lord. You're going to finish this uh, mission of delivering us from this spirit of Baal. And you're going to break that stronghold. You're going to show yourself strong in the midst of doing that. You're going to demonstrate to this nation that you are God. Some of them won't like it, but they're all going to know it. That Jesus is Lord. And Yahweh is God. And that he's not afraid to deal with that spirit. And he's not afraid to march his people right in front of it and do it. He's not afraid to let it look like they're in control again.
Checkmate is coming. Checkmate is coming. Revival is coming. Awakening is coming. Turnaround is coming. So Lord, we prophesy into this again today and we say, you are Lord and Master. There is no other God but you. This nation will be truly recovenanted, sevened to you. This presence movement that's coming will all be all about honoring you in this glorious marriage. Jesus and his bride. And America will picture this again. This movement will focus around worship. It's that Welsh thing again. They called the Welsh revival the singing revival. It's the worship. Lord, we're coming back to that. So we seven ourselves to you now here. It's a prophetic picture and statement. And we say, we are yours. We are betrothed to you. We are married to you. We're in love with you. We're crazy about you. We will serve no other gods. Somebody pray. Father, in chapter 7 of Exodus, you stretched forth your hand. And you brought Israel into that place of covenant. And you set to freeing them. Lord, in chapter 12, you told Moses to stretch forth his hand. The partnership had begun. And Father, I thank you today that you are bringing your ecclesia into a place that we're not afraid to stand in the, in the face of adversity. Whether it's Egypt coming after us, Lord, or whether it's those among our ranks afraid or bad-mouthing or criticizing what you're doing, your remnant will stand. And Father, you brought us into this place of standing after doing all to stand. You've given us ground. And Father, we decree today, we'll not let it go. We'll not give it back. We'll not surrender it to the enemy. And we, that, that surrender spirit is broken off of the church in Jesus' name. And Father, we'll not be like Egypt. Dear God, uh, like Israel was in Egypt, thinking it's better there. God, where we've been is not better than where you're taking us. And Father, we thank you today, God, that on the other side of this sea that we're backed up against today, in the nation of America, there is a promised land. There is a land that you promised us to be. There's a prophetic declaration getting ready to be manifested over America. There are promises, God, that are coming true when we get on the other side of this sea. So Father, we say today, bring on Egypt. Bring on the Pharaohs and back us up against whatever you need to back us up against so we can get on with what you have declared over us as a nation. And Father, we thank you today. We are not afraid. We do not carry the spirit of fear, but we stand today in that power and that love and that sound, sober, thinking mind that you've given us as your ecclesia. Father, I thank you this weekend has shifted your church. This weekend has brought us as an ecclesia into a place that we've never been before. You've backed us up against the sea and you're getting ready to make a mockery out of the enemy that he has never expected. So Father, throw your final blow over the enemies of America. Cast down these false gods that have built their thrones up above your throne. Push us back against the water for we know that's where your wind is. That's where the miracles are taking place today. And Father, as you begin to do this, there is a countless score of those that you have called by your name getting ready to walk across from Egypt into a place of us seeing the miracles fulfilled that you said America would do. So Father, we make a declaration today over this nation that has been made many, many, many times. America shall be saved.
About four months ago, such confidence began to fill my entire being that God was moving everything on the chessboard of this world. And I asked Holy Spirit something, and in light of what Dust just shared, I said, Holy Spirit, give me, sum this up in a phrase. Because I wanted a phrase, you know, it's like catchy. And here's what he said. Hell doesn't have a chance. Not in light of our God. I'm telling you, God has this and hell doesn't have a chance. We're taking this, we're taking this nation back and hell doesn't have a chance. We're taking our families back. We're taking the prodigals back. Hell doesn't have a chance. Our God is moving. Our God is moving. Hallelujah. Checkmate. Man, checkmate. You could almost preach it every week. Checkmate. If you think God is not smarter than our adversaries, I mean, how could you even go there? I mean... As I put out, come on, man. You think our God's not more powerful? Come on, man. Yeah. Well, Dutch was preaching. Towards the end of his preaching, the Lord gave me a vision. I feel I need to share it with you today to pray into or however you feel what you want to handle it. But I, I saw in this vision the founding fathers standing over in this area. And as Dutch began to preach, I saw that they were taking off their coats and they were coming and laying them on the altar one by one as Dutch would make a point over America concerning these false gods. And then as Dutch began to wrap it up, uh, George Washington was the last one that I saw come and he laid a coat on the altar. And as Dutch wrapped up his message today, Benjamin Franklin began to take some type of instrument and he began to strike the liberty bell and so I just feel like the Lord is saying today that what we are seeing here is dealing with the foundation of our nation and that when we get these things deal with there's going to be a ring from the bell of liberty over this nation like we've never ever heard before God's going to ring the bell. He's going to ring the devil's bell too. What we heard. <laughs> the bell ring. Such a prophetic flow. What was it? In, I don't know when it was. Yesterday. No doubt it. Don't you doubt this. Don't you doubt this. Don't doubt it. God's up to something. Hallelujah.